before, I'm Laura Piercy. I am one of the associate directors of the SWAP. Um, and I am also the UCAS coordinator for Ackland Burley School. So if your uh, child is based at Ackland Burley, uh, you will see quite a lot of me, even more of me, uh, in the next, uh, in year 13, because I will be quite closely involved with their UCAS application. Uh, but I do have an oversight of UCAS applications across the consortium. Um, I just thought you know a little bit about me. I've been working uh, in with UCAS and around uh, higher education for a long time. I'm also a member of the UCAS Advisors Advisory Group. So I meet regularly with uh, UCAS advisors all over the country. Uh, so I am quite a good person to get in touch with. If you've got any questions about UCAS, uh, I, am, I am available. So today, then, we are going to start uh, pretty much at the beginning from the very, very basics of UCAS. Uh, because I know not everyone has been to university or not everyone's been to university in the UK and have been through systems that are quite different. So I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm going to talk through the UCAS process and what your what year 12s will be going, the process they'll be going through for the next year. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, students who maybe don't want to go to university and what their options are. Uh, again, and we will be focusing on those as well across the swap over the next few months. So, hopefully you are able to see my screen now, uh, and we can now. Uh, and we can get going. So uh, these slides will be available as well. I can email these to you, no problem after the presentation. So don't worry too much about taking notes of links and whatnot. Uh, this one on the front page is probably the most important link uh, that I can point out to you because this is the link for uh, UCAS parents to sign up uh, to get news from UCAS. So this will send you uh, things like deadlines, uh, things like um, when deadlines are coming up, when students have got things they have to do, if there are any changes, if there are UCAS events, things like that, it will send them straight into your inbox. So I would really, really recommend that you sign up for that. Uh, before we get on with the presentation proper, I'm just going to tell you about a couple of things that are happening at the SWAP um, over the next few weeks uh, to support our Year 12 students. One of these is Futures Day, which is Monday, the 1st of July. So this takes place uh, during the normal school day on Monday the 1st of July and it's for all the SWAP students. It is the key point of information for UCAS. So during period one and two on Monday the 1st of July, students all across the SWAP will be completing the bulk of their UCAS applications. After that, for period three and four, there will be a carousel of sessions featuring all these brilliant uh, companies that uh, you can see on your screen now, plus some others as well. Uh, we've got all these visitors coming into the SWAP to talk to students about uh, university pathways, about apprenticeship pathways, about careers in service design, operations, marketing, accountancy, finance. Uh, um, what else have we got there? Public relations, engineering, uh, all different, you know, all different kinds of stuff, public sector, NHS. Um, so it is a really good day um, and we are we want all the SWAP students to take part in that. Um, on next Monday on the uh, 24th, is it 24th of June next Monday? I hope I've got that date right. Next Monday, um, students will be signing up to the sessions they want to go to during period three tutorial. So please make sure they are in that period three on Monday so they get their first choice of, uh, of sessions. Next couple of things that are happening, we have done uh, six different trips to universities and workplaces this half term. Uh, the two, the final two that are just booking now or, um, as of this week are on the screen. Um, and they are to London Met School of Social Science and Middlesex Business School. So uh, this information will go out through tutors and through heads of year. But just so you know that this is happening, uh, the you, please, uh, if you're if you've got children who are interested in studying uh, social sciences or business and related subjects, these two trips are ideal for them. They are bespoke for us. So these two universities are putting these days on just for us at the swap. There's no one else there. So uh, it is a really, really good opportunity. 
Um, and finally, we've got a few seminars coming up as well. Thursday this week and then Tuesday the 2nd and Wednesday the 3rd of July, uh, we've got some uh, sort of university level uh, flying high seminars coming up that are at La Swap and Ackland Burley School. So again, uh, loads of good stuff. Right. Moving on then. Um, to start talking about UCAS. So first thing, most important thing, uh, I think for you to stick on your fridge or in a uh, a, a very visible place uh, at this time are the key dates for UCAS for our year 12s. So the first deadline coming up is what we call the early entry deadline. It's just called that because it is an earlier deadline than the main uh, UCAS deadline. And that is the deadline for Oxford, Cambridge, Medicine, Dentistry and Veterinary courses. And that is the 15th of October. We then have a couple of internal deadlines uh, set by us at the swap around personal statements. Um, and the end of that half term, next half term, is when UCAS support in tutorial will end. So in personal development and tutorial for the next half term, there'll be lots and lots of stuff about personal statements and UCAS things. But after that date on in that October, that will end um, and students will uh, be will be able to work on their UCAS independently. Uh, the final deadline, what we call the final deadline for applications to UCAS is the, is the last Wednesday in January. Uh, which is the 29th of January next year. Uh, this is an equal consideration deadline. So that means that any application that comes to UCAS before that deadline, the universities have to look at it. Uh, so it is quite a fair and equal consideration deadline. Um, if you meet that deadline, so if you get your application in by the, sorry, that says 31st, so it should be 29th. It's the 29th next year. Um, if you get your application in by that date, then the universities have to uh, respond to your uh, application by the 14th of May. And we'll look a bit about what those different responses can be. And then students have until the 4th of June to make their decisions about which offers they want to take up. So that's looking at the next sort of year when the main key deadlines are. I've put at the bottom there that early applications are better, even though the equal consideration deadline isn't until the end of January. Generally, and the earlier an application goes in, the earlier you get a response. That's not the case for all courses, uh, but it is the case for most. So we do encourage our students to get their applications in as soon as possible. So uh, before we get, as we get stuck in properly, uh, I will just say, if you've got any questions at all about anything that I'll talk about for the next sort of half an hour, 40 minutes or so, please do feel free to put them in the chat and then I will come to them at the end of the presentation. Starting at the beginning, then, what is UCAS? So it stands for the Universities and Colleges Admission Service, um, and it is the centralised service that students you in the UK use to apply to UK universities. So rather than applying to each, sending an application to each university separately, you put your application through UCAS, and UCAS acts as like an admin system for sending your application off to all the different courses that you're interested in. Um, if you are studying an undergraduate degree in the UK, you will probably apply through UCAS. There are a very, very few number of private universities that don't use UCAS, but it's tiny. Um, and UCAS have what's called an apply and track function, uh, which students use to send their applications and to manage their applications. So they log on, they do it all online. We can then track that application at school, which is really, really handy. Whoever the UCAS coordinator is in your child's base school will be able to see what they put on their application and will be able to see uh, when they start it, when they submit it, whether they've submitted it or not, how much they've completed on it, all those kind of things. We also press the final button to send it to UCAS. So the student doesn't send their application themselves. They send it to us. We then add uh, the reference and predicted grades, uh, and it's us that press that button in the end. So it comes down, it, it, it is the school that do the final sending off. UCAS does have a cost attached to it. It's £28.50 this year, which is the admin cost for UCAS. However, if a student receives bursary, uh, at the minute, a sixth form bursary, or they, and or they receive free school meals, UCAS will be free from this cycle. This is the first time that UCAS have waived the fee. Um, and your uh, if your that does apply to your child, they will be told about that through their tutorial. They don't have to do anything. The school add that information. You pay for UCAS right at the end, like at the last minute when when you press the button. So you don't have to worry about that for the time being. Uh, but if your child does get bursary, it will just be that they will send their application without having that payment screen. 
This is the UCAS application at a glance then. So uh, just a very, very quick overview of what happens. So you set up a, uh, an account with UCAS, you then link it to your base school using a buzzword. The Burley one is Burley 2025. They're usually very similar. Um, most students will already have a UCAS Hub account. If they came to uh, the Excel Center in March for UCAS Discovery, they had to create a UCAS Hub account to sign up for that, uh, that visit. So we felt merely uh, we had 400 LSWAP students went to that. So lots and lots of our students already have an account. They then complete all what we call it the general and admin bit. So loads of help is available from school. They will do most of that on Futures Day on the 1st. They enter their qualifications. They enter their choices. They enter their personal statement. They pay their money unless they're entitled to free school meals, in which case it's free. Um, the school, their base school, then enters their predicted grades and their academic reference. That application is sent to UCAS, and then the uh, the departments at each university review that application, and they make a decision about whether they are going to make an offer or not on the courses that have been applied for. What do we do then? So we'll talk about your child's role in a sec. What is our role in all this? So every child has a tutor, and their job is to oversee the UCAS application, which will mainly be done in that period three on Monday, personal development for the end of this term and the first ter first half term of autumn. Uh, they help to advise on choices. They review personal statements and give feedback. And they also put your child's reference together from the references that the subject teachers produce. Subject teachers then write an academic reference for each uh, student that they teach. They also provide the predicted grades. Um, subject teachers also provide support with interview prep or pre-assessment prep or portfolio prep if that is required for the course that, you're, uh, that, that a child is applying for. And then the head of year, director of learning or UCAS coordinator, sometimes they're the same person. The UCAS coordinator is the same as one of those. Sometimes it's slightly different, but they sit kind of above there. They, we advise on university choices. We also review the overall application. We also help with personal statements and references. And ultimately, we are the ones that send that application to UCAS. I'm just going to very briefly go then through the different bits of the UCAS application that uh, students have to complete. Um, I'm not going to go into loads of detail on it, and I'll show you what it looks like in a second. Um, but the what we call the admin bits at the beginning, these are really, really straightforward. So this is all the kind of things you'd expect, uh, name, where you live, uh, your email address, um, and really importantly, whether or not you tell UCAS whether or not you are planning to take a student loan. Uh, this isn't the application for student finance. That comes much later in, in, in year 13. But this is the indication where, whether you tell UCAS that you're going to be taking a loan or not. This takes maybe 15 minutes to fill in. It's really, really quick. The next sections are a little bit more in depth and we like students to spend a bit more time on them because these are the sections that can affect what kind of offers they get made by the universities they've applied for. So they don't become available until the admin sections are complete. So when you first log into UCAS, you can't see these two bits. It's only when you've started filling in the other bits that they pop up uh, down the left hand side. And these sections, the first section, diversity inclusion, allows students to tell UCAS about their ethnicity, any disabilities they may have, sexuality, gender. Um, it also allows UCAS, them to tell UCAS about their parental education and occupational background and if they've ever been in care. Now, this is important because if a student is a first generation applicant, so if um, their if, if their parents or grandparents haven't been to university, this can mean that they can occasionally get a contextual offer from some universities um, as part of widening participation, as universities are keen to get people who've never have no history of university education in their family into their universities. If a student has ever been in care, they will often receive a contextual offer based on that. The more about you section. Um, then allows them to give a bit more detail about any physical or mental health conditions, any caring responsibilities, if they've ever received free school meals and more. Again, uh, the point about free school meals is really, really key because it can lead to contextual offers if a student is from a, a more, a, a, a more what, what they call a more disadvantaged background. Um, and if a student has any physical or mental health conditions, that can help because the university, that may provide some context about their educational background, or 
if they need support when they get to university, for example, if you need a laptop, if you need special software like voice to text or anything like that, then this can help the university to put that support in place. We strongly advise that this information is disclosed to UCAS. You don't have to. Uh, you, this is all optional. You don't have to give any of this. Uh, but we really do advise that students give this information where they are comfortable because it can really help their application. There is also a section on each student's reference that is an extenuating circumstances section where teachers can add any information they know about that student in terms of uh, it might be health conditions or it might be disruption to their education, things like that. Um, and we always include, we, we talk to the student about what we include, but we always include things that we believe will support their application. It can never be a negative, it can only support. We then move on to the education section uh, where this can be a little bit tricky because in the education section, you have to enter all the qualifications you've already done you also have to enter that under the school you did it at. So if you went to uh, Lusanta Union for your GCSEs, you put it under Lusanta Union. Uh, if you went to your, wh whichever school you went to, you add the school and you put it under. But you also need the exam board and the grade. So that often means that students will have to dig out their GCSE certificates to find the which exam board they sat the exam with. So please uh, warn them of that in advance uh, because they may need uh, to take some photos of their GCSE certificates to get the right information. Um, if they did a qualification more than once, so GCSE reset, they should enter the most recent grade and the best grade. Hopefully they're the same, but if they're not, they have to enter both. And they also have to enter any qualifications they are currently studying. So they put in their current A-levels, BTECs, Cambridge Technicals, GCSE resets, whatever they are currently doing now at the swap. But they don't enter a grade for those because tutors enter the predicted grade. I'm just going to stop here a second because I'm going to show you uh, what just what it looks like, um, what the LaSwap website looks like, if I can find it. Not the LaSwap website, UCAS website. Sorry, I've got too many tabs open. Uh, unfortunately, it's not allowing me. Let me see if this will work. There we go. So to move some things around. So this is what it looks like uh, when your child logs in. It will show how much of their application is in process. There's lots of different things they can read about, find information about on the, on the uh, UCAS website. Uh, but the important bit is in here. Where they can show you how to add their choices. It's nice and big, so they can't miss that bit out. And here they will find all the different sections to fill in the bits that I have just talked about. So it's really nice and clear uh, and really easy to find the bits that they uh, that they need to find. The personal statement goes in right at the bottom and the reference is put in by the teachers, not by the student. As I say, on Futures Day, all this will be will be shown to them in lots of detail. The final bit then are the choices in the personal statement. Uh, they do, they are last. Uh, we really recommend that students start looking at this over summer, start planning their personal statements, start doing some research, visiting unis where they can, making short lists, uh, doing extra and super curricular uh, activities. If your child is early entry, so if they are pl applying for Oxford, Cambridge, medicine, dentistry, or veterinary, the deadline is so much earlier, the 15th of October. This all has to be finished by the time they come back to us in September. So the first tricky thing, I think the 
all that admin stuff is pretty straightforward. Like the, the hardest thing that students are faced with, I think, at, at this stage is choosing the right courses. There has been some guidance through tutorials from tutors about choosing the right courses, but it can be really, really difficult. Um, there are lots of different things to look at. We would advise that students look really closely at uh, the type of university. Uh, whether it's a campus or whether it's in a city, because that will obviously affect the where they live, whether they live in halls, whether they live out of halls, what the transport is like, the location of both the university and the university compared to the city. The most important thing, of course, is the course itself. So what modules are available? How is it assessed? Are there lots of exams? Is there lots of coursework? Um, it can also be worth looking at graduate destinations and league table rankings. Um, but all the league tables use different criteria. So some of them include research. Some of them don't. Uh, they can be a bit tricky to navigate, uh, but they can give you a bit of an idea. I do think it's more helpful to look at subject rankings rather than look at the university overall, look at that particular subject. Uh, so, but they can be another tool. Uh, Unifrog uh, is great. Three of our schools, of the swap schools, use Unifrog. One uh, school uses Growfar, but they both have the uh, similar information on there. And students can use those websites to uh, narrow down ideas and to make short lists that they can save and share with you so you can look at things together. The best way, absolutely best way, is to visit the university in person if you can at all. I mean, I know that's really tricky if they're thinking of applying to university in Edinburgh. <laughs> uh, but if you can get there, it is ideal that you get there. If you can't get to that exact uni, get to as many different open days uh, um, as you can to get a feel for different types of universities. And if you really, really can't make it, then there are often online tours and online tasters. Um, you can help them. You can help uh, your students by uh, you know, helping them to look at entry requirements, by helping them to narrow down their choices and really have a think about where these you know, where these universities are, what they're like. Um, you know, do they you know, Edinburgh might look amazing or Glasgow might look amazing. They're both amazing universities. But do they want to live an eight hour train journey away from home? Is that you know, is is that something that uh, that you know, they they would be comfortable with or find really difficult? Um, please encourage them to read the course content. Um, history, for example, is is very big, um, and a history degree at one university is very different to a history degree at another university. Um, so they should really look at what the modules available are, look at the assessments, and also thinking about how it links to what they want to do in the future. Some students are really sure and they do really vocational courses like, like midwifery, for example. Some students are not just such not so sure and they do something quite broad to keep their options open. Both are completely fine, but it's just about considering that. Oh, of course, the last one. Uh, do they actually enjoy it? <laughs> uh, three years is a long time to be studying one subject. They have to really like it. So once they've answered those questions and they're sort of confident that, yes, I want to do history, uh, I want to do, uh, I want to focus on more modern history, I want to focus on political history, or I want to focus on Middle Eastern history, whatever it is they want to do, uh, then they can start to really narrow down those shortlists. We recommend that students choose two aspirational courses, two safe courses, and one backup course, making up their five UCAS choices. You don't have to put five choices on UCAS if they don't want to choose five. That's completely fine. Uh, but your £28.50 pays for five, so you may as well. Um, they can choose more than one course at the same university. So if they go and visit, you know, uh, York and they fall in love with it, then they can choose two different courses at York. Uh, they shouldn't choose five courses that need three A stars or five courses that need you know, three D's and E's. There should be a range of courses in terms of entry requirements. And another thing to remember is that the same UCAS application goes to all five courses. So those courses have to be quite similar to each other because they only get one personal statement and it has to make sense to each different admissions tutor. Um, each admissions tutor can't see the other places you've applied to. They can only see that your application's gone to them. So if you apply for physics and you apply for English literature and you send your physics personal statement off to English literature, they're going to be really confused. So they need courses need to be in a similar course family. 
So sociology and criminology is fine. Uh, maths and acting is not. Um, entry criteria. So uh, entry requirements for each university can be listed in two ways. Uh, universities will either say we want you know, this many grades or they sometimes ask for UCAS points instead of grades. And this is where the UCAS tariff comes in because each grade at A level and at BTEC is worth a fixed number of UCAS points. So as you can see here, they are uh, your, your A stars are equivalent to your distinction stars. Um, and then the grades, uh, there are more grades, of course, at A level. So the points go down slightly differently. Sometimes they list grades. Sometimes they'll say we want three Bs. Sometimes they'll say we want 120 points. The best ones say both, so you don't have to work it out. Um, now, you can get your UCAS points from other places that are not your BTEC or your A-level. So uh, high-level music grades um, carry UCAS points, but usually a university will say, we only want points to come from your A-levels or BTECs. So you can't, although it's good to put those things on the application, you can't use them often to, uh, to get into the university. Link to the tariff calculators on there. Uh, just to show you what we would recommend, so a student doing A-levels predicted three Bs, we would recommend this kind of spread of courses in terms of the grades, and a student doing a BTEC and A-level mixed uh, uh, sort of mixed uh, group of qualifications, uh, we would recommend they go for something like this as their, uh, as their recommended courses. But again, there is tons of help through tutors and in tutorials to make sure that they pick the right courses. The personal statement is the last thing that they will write. Uh, this is their opportunity to show universities that they're the best student for that course. Um, there are nearly every student applying for a course will have similar grades often. So if a grade, if, you know, if a course requires AAB, then students applying are nearly all going to be predicted AAB or higher. So it can be quite hard for universities to distinguish between applicants and the personal statement is the best way to do that. Um, it is primarily an academic document. So at least 85% of the statement should be about skills, uh, how they've used those skills, what they've done in their subject, extra reading, super curricular work they've done outside of subject. Um, and also be well written, well communicate well, um, and they can include extracurricular and work experience, but it has to be relevant to the course being applied for. Um, we give lots and lots of support with personal statements, both in terms of how to start them, how to craft them, personal statement planning, and also individual one-to-one -one feedback from tutors. So don't worry at this stage too much about it. But as I said, summer is a really good time to start drafting that out and thinking, right, have I done it? If I'm applying, I'm applying for English literature, have I done some extra reading? You know, I'm applying, have I, have I got those things that can go in my personal statement? The final section then is the reference. Uh, and the reference, as I said, is written by your, by subject teachers. Uh, it also includes some general information about the swap and that's the same on every single student's uh, application. It's, a, it's an identical statement. And it also includes extenuating circumstances specific to that student. Next Monday in uh, tutorial time, period three, we will be giving students a form, an online form, and asking them to about any extenuating circumstances that they would like to tell us about. So again, that's why it's really important for students to be in Monday period three at this time of year, because there's a lot going on around UCAS and similar. Um, predicted grades also form part of the statement. These are decided by teachers based on, they're a holistic grade, they're based on work in year 12, HSE grades and potential to improve. The predicted grade is not just a straight HSE grade, it is more holistic than that. Um, we always set our predicted grades to give students our best, the best possible chance, but we will not fabricate them. And we also will not change uh, predicted grades based on the university a student is applying to. Uh, so we will we will give realistic but aspirational predicted grades. Um, the sixth form team, so heads of years, directors will not change predicted grades set by subject teachers because we're not specialists, they're the experts. Um, and we do have the full our full predicted grades policy on the LISWAP website. Uh, so please do take time to familiarize yourself with that. 
Moving on a little bit later in the year then, so we've done our application, we've sent it off, we've met the January deadline, what happens next? How do the universities make offers out of all these thousands of applications that come in? Well, the first thing they look at is generally the predicted grade, they look at the personal statement, they look at any contextual sort of offers around, um, as I said before, free school meals, bursary, if, you, if parents have been to university, uh, they look at whether you've been to state school or private school and all those kind of different factors. Uh, some pay lots of attention to those things, some don't pay much attention at all. Some universities um, or some courses, you have to sit an assessment. It's not very many, but some do. And some universities and courses also interview you. Popular courses tend to have higher entry requirements, so because more people are wanting to do them. At the minute, the, the most popular courses at the minute are law and psychological sciences. So entry requirements for those courses are quite high. Uh, across universities um, and at very competitive universities, uh, they are very, very difficult to get a place on. I think psychological science at Cambridge is down to something like 9% uh, you, 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 nine of applicants uh, get a place. So it's, it is very competitive. At those very competitive places, so at um, Oxbridge Medicine, Dentistry and Veterinary, expect to have an interview. Those interviews will take place usually between November and November and December for Oxbridge. They can go all the way up to April uh, for medicine and adjacents. Um, and lots of vocational degrees, such as nursing or midwifery or education, also interview. Uh, practical or performing uh, degrees, audition. And art courses usually ask for a portfolio. So there are slightly different kind of conditions around those different courses but most other courses don't interview so if you're applying for um you know, sociology at five different universities uh chances are you're not going to be interviewed for that course um if a student is applying for medicine or dentistry they will need to sit an assessment called a ucat um and some other uh some universities require an assessment for some other courses as well. Uh, the, most, uh, po the most common being the MAT for maths, the LNAT for law, the PAT for physics. Sometimes computer science courses also want a MAT. Please check the entry requirements carefully on the course pages to work out if this is the case, because a lot of the time you need to book those assessments now. <laughs> uh, the, in fact, uh, UCAT bookings opened today, yesterday. Uh, most Oxbridge courses require pre-assessments, but again, most other universities don't. I am talking about quite a small number of universities here. Uh, if you're unsure about this, do speak to your tutor ahead of year, or you can, or students can email me as well if they need a hand. A quick note then on early entry. Uh, if uh, a child, if your child, if you've got a student who is early entry, their base school should know by now because that entry de that deadline is the fifteenth of October, so it's it's months before the main UCAS deadline. Um, early entry is anything at Oxford and Cambridge, medicine, dentistry, dentistry and veterinary. No other courses. Other health courses like midwifery and nursing are not early entry. They follow the January deadline. If you have a child, if a child is just deciding now they want to apply for one of these courses, please tell them to speak to their head of year as soon as possible so their head of year knows. Uh, there will be interview prep and personal statement guidance for these students in September. Hopefully the next thing that happens then is we get an offer. So we complete the application, we meet the deadline, the universities consider it, and they make us an offer. Early applications often equal early offers, so we encourage students to get them in as soon as possible. Most offers are made before the end of March, but uh, very, very popular courses might wait a little bit longer because they've got more applicants to get through. And there are generally two types of offers that you're made. Conditional, which is if you get this number of points, you get a place, or unconditional, you get a place regardless of grade outcome. Again, students will get lots of guidance about this next term. And then the next step is to choose which offers, hopefully of the five, you want to take up. So students can pick a firm one where they definitely want to go and a backup one. The backup one should be lower in terms of points than the main one. And they can't swap back and forth between the two. So they should be certain um, and confident. They have until June to make that decision. So it's absolutely ages to go to open days and talk to you and talk to tutors and everything like that. 
Students should look at unconditionals really carefully and not be swayed by an unconditional and don't choose it as an easy option. Uh, it is you know, really worth looking at unconditional offers very, very carefully. Very quickly on clearing and extra. Um, if a student doesn't get any offers, they will be entered into clearing, which is uh, basically just the directory of all the courses that are not full. Clearing opens in July. Um, I'm doing another webinar at the start of July for our current year 13 about clearing, uh, which goes into it in a lot more detail. Uh, so all, but all you really need to know at the minute is that if you don't get any offers, so if a student doesn't get any offers, that's not the end. There is like a whole extra clearing uh, system that they can use to find a new course. And if when you get your results, you do loads better than you expected, you can also use clearing to find a a different course for that reason as well. So it can be used in different ways. I'm not going to talk much about loans and paying for university because we do quite a bit on this next year. And I also do some webinars and parent sessions on this next year. Uh, but just a little bit of reassurance at this stage. I just want to reassure people that uh, tuition fees and loans look really daunting. And there's a lot of chat in the media at the minute about the value of degrees and there's a lot of political rhetoric about it. But ultimately, although it looks like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, <laughs> you the amount that students pay back is actually small. Um, they pay back 9% of pre-tax earnings, anything they earn, over £25,000. So a student earning 30 grand pays about £38 a month back off their student loan. So it's not a huge burden for most students when they leave university. Obviously, the more you earn, the more you pay back, because the more you earn over 25 grand, you, you pay 9% of that amount. So you pay more back. But uh, you should, but students should be encouraged to borrow as much as they need because the amount they pay back is based on what they earn, not what they borrowed. So uh, it's not you know, if you if you you shouldn't restrict your borrowing because you're afraid of how much it will cost per month. You'll just pay it back for longer. Again, loads more on this next year. The deadline for student finance is the end of May. Um, so. We have plenty of time and we uh, always do some talks and some sessions for students around February and some stuff for parents and families around March of year 13 about student finance. So how can you help? Uh, lots of things that you can do to help uh, around talking to your child about what's realistic and what they will what they will enjoy, what's what they will can will realistically want to do for the next three years if you can go with them to visit universities or send them off to send to open days that's perfect uh if you if you can or if you feel confident reading personal statements with them please do if not send them to a teacher we will help them talk about courses and careers talk about you know, what they're interested in um if you again if you can help with extracurriculars or supercurriculars please do if you can't just remind them to go and do things ask them what are you doing over this you know, over summer are you attending any lectures are you going to any galleries or museums are you going to see a play you know what can you do to kind of improve uh that super curricular learning make send them on trips we put on the you know, make sure they go to things like futures day make sure they go to tutorials make sure they go to personal development make you know, make sure they make use of their tutor because that is such a good resource for them Uh, finally, know the deadlines. Put the deadlines as a sellotape them to the fridge, you know, screenshot them, keep them on your phone, and remind them of when deadlines are. Uh, there are some useful links here to uh, different bits that I've been uh, I've been talking about, uh, which I'm not going to go through now because it's just repeating. Uh, this is good if you are concerned about tuition fees and student loans. Like the Martin Lewis stuff is good. So. That's 
a lot on UCAS. Just a quick note then about if they don't want to go to university or if they don't want to go to university right now, because we have an increasing number of students who are taking gap years, um, I think partly because of COVID, partly because of you know, like GCSEs and A-levels and BTECs are really hard and they want a break. Some of our students go and work for a year to earn some money, uh, but there are lots of students doing different things after year 13 now that aren't just going straight off to uni. So they don't have to. They don't have to go to uni. Uh, there are other options. Um, a little less known option is that students uh, can actually go and do more further education, further education, if that works well for them. So we have a really big, we have a big group of students each year. I was talking to one of the Burley art teachers about them earlier today who go and do art foundation. So an extra year of art, uh, usually at UAL or Camden Working Men's College or at Ravensbourne or similar universities and colleges around London. Um, standalone foundation years like Art Foundation are free if you're under 19 when you start, uh, so they can be a really good option. And we've also had students who have done what they chose to do at level three wasn't maybe quite what they now want to do. So they go and do another course at college that is a little bit closer. So we had a, a student, this is a few years ago now, who went off to Capel Manor to do a diploma in veterinary science because she wanted to do veterinary nursing. And so she did an extra year to mean that it, she was more likely to get on that veterinary nursing course. So that is an option, you know, more education, but not necessarily at university. Um, the big one, obviously the big buzzword at the minute, we're hearing a lot, everybody talking about apprenticeships and, and, and how great they are. And they are absolutely brilliant options for some students. Uh, they are a full time combination of work and study. Um, students who are at the swap will be looking at uh, two different kinds of apprenticeships, either a higher or advanced apprenticeship, which is the same as A-levels, level three BTECs or just above. Or there are a smaller number of degree level apprenticeships around. These are uh, apprenticeships that include an undergraduate degree. So when you leave, you've also got your degree. There are a huge range of sectors uh, that, that do apprenticeships and some which have an increasing number of apprenticeships. Uh, the main ones I would say are probably uh, things like law is up and coming, accountancy, lots in engineering, lots in business and business management, project management, high level admin. Uh, and there are also some in traditional sectors that you might associate more with apprenticeships. So things like construction or hair and beauty, things like that. They still exist, uh, but there are a lot of apprenticeships in uh, more kind of office based <laughs> sort of professions now as well. This is a really important link at the bottom here because. It's not on that screen uh, because there is no UCAS for apprenticeships, but the government do gather all the apprenticeships together on one in one website. And I'll, I'll explain what what the implication of that is in a sec. So just so you know the difference between them, degree level apprenticeships usually take five years. So they're a big commitment and they combine work and study, whereas level three and four are usually 12 or 18 months. Uh, degree apprentices don't pay any tuition fees. The degree is free and they are earning, so they don't need a loan. So it is a very cost effective way to go to university. Um, if you do a level three or four apprenticeship, so the 12, 18 month one, uh, after that, you can either stay in that, if they offer you a job, you can stay and work there. You can go on and do another apprenticeship, such as a degree apprenticeship, or you can go into full-time work, or you can actually go to university after your apprenticeship if you decide to. So it doesn't cut you off going and doing other things in the future. Um, one thing to bear in mind is whereas some sectors are really promoting apprenticeship learning, uh, there are some sectors that don't really have many or any apprenticeships. And unfortunately, that does tend to be media and the arts. Uh, they don't tend to have many paid apprenticeships at all. But if you are interested in other sectors, there's loads of stuff around. And it is also worth bearing in mind that some apprenticeships are very, very competitive. Um, apprenticeships at places like Google and PricewaterhouseCooper and things like that uh, can be harder to get a place on uh, than, than a degree at Oxbridge uh, because they only have a handful of spots available each year. So just like degrees, it's good to be realistic about apprenticeships and apprenticeship applications. 
Unfortunately, there is no central hub, so you can't do Apprenticeship UCAS and just do your one personal statement and send it off all over the place. You've got to apply to each apprenticeship separately, uh, which does mean it's quite it is more time consuming than applying to university. And it's also more varied because applications are as varied as job interviews. They can involve they will always involve some kind of personal statement and application form, but they often involve uh, sort of phone interviews or Zoom interviews and task days and things like that. So they can be quite complicated. Um, students who are interested in apprenticeships have to be active and seek them out. Like they they won't kind of drop in their lap. They've got to you know, do the work for them. And they also need to be enthusiastic and keen and work ready because an apprenticeship is a job. So it is, you know, a, a, an eight to five or or whatever. Uh, and they are well, they are, will be expected to be there sort of on time every day working with adults. So it need you know, they need to be aware of all those things before they apply. And because they can be quite competitive, uh, students should think should be prepared to apply for several apprenticeships before they get accepted and you know, be understand that they might not get the first one that they go for and they might need a little bit of practice before they uh, before they get the hang of it um the time frame for apprenticeships is it's really it, it doesn't have deadlines like UCAS so it's it's all year really um if for apprenticeships starting in August 2025, opportunities will usually start to appear the October before. So October this year, 2024, start next year. And there's often a big bump of apprenticeship uh, that come out around February and March. So they're the kind of key times that students should be looking, October, February and March. But the best thing to do is to sign up for alerts uh, on UCAS or Unifrog or through the government website uh, for key, uh, keyword alerts. So when new opportunities come out, they're straight in their inbox and they can get a wriggle on and they can apply for them. We do offer help, again, just as we offer help with UCAS, we offer help with apprenticeship applications at the swap as well. So lots of students, as I said at the top of this, they want to go to university, but they don't really want to go right now. Um, they want to take a gap year or the, the, you, for whatever reason. And I found, I found anecdotally that there has been an increase in students taking uh, defer, doing deferred applications and taking gap years in the last couple of years. Um, so my advice is to still apply now while they're at school. But when they fill in their UCAS application, instead of putting 2025 entry, they put 2026 entry. In that case, they will get an offer at the same time as people who are going next year, but it will be for 2026. Um, the process is the same. Um, if they then change their mind during that gap year, they can just let the uni know that they're not coming. Um, you know, it's not a contract or anything. They don't have to go, uh, but it does give them that kind of uni place in the bag beforehand. Um, you can't defer for every single course. Maths courses often don't let you defer. Oxbridge aren't keen on it. Um, law in a lot of places aren't keen on it. So again, check the entry requirements. It might say no deferred applications, in which case, of course, don't put one in. Um, some courses will let students apply now for 2025 and then change their mind later. So ring them up in, say, May and say, actually, can I, I want to come, but can I come next year instead? Some let you do that, but they don't have to. Uh, the most competitive courses can, will likely say, no, you either come now or you withdraw and reapply next year. Uh, but, lots, but lots of places will let you, so it can be worth a go if you have changed your mind. Um, if you apply during, uh, if, you, if you if you take your gap year, you can, of course, apply during that gap year instead of applying now. Uh, there are some benefits to that in that um, you'll have your actual grades, so you don't need to put predicted grades in, so you tend to get a quicker response and things like that. But obviously, the downside is that you won't have the support in like in real time like by going to tutorials and things like that. We do offer some support to year 14 students, but obviously it can't be as comprehensive because you're not with us all the time. So we're not seeing you. Um, we do have some guidelines for ex-student ex student applicants. So people who've left 
uh, on our website. So if you're if you're thinking about taking a gap year, do read those uh, because they do have uh, internal deadlines around when you can request a reference and things like that, which are different to the main UCAS deadlines because we have to give people time to uh, to write them and process them. So please do have a look at that if you're thinking about deferrals. So we are at the end. Uh, a few contacts then for you. Uh, again, I can send this round if you don't have these emails. Uh, my email is at the top. Um, I've put the contacts for the heads of year uh, below. Uh, the heads of years are the UCAS coordinators in most cases. In the case of Ackland Burley, I am the UCAS coordinator. So uh, you can, of course, email Mr. Stokes and Mr. Alley, and they will be more than happy to help you. Uh, but if you've got an, an Ackland Burley specific UCAS query, you can also email me because I am as I say, I am in charge of that. At the other schools, I am not directly in charge of their UCAS, so you should contact the head of year if you have a, uh, a question about a specific student or about predicted grades or things. But if you have general UCAS inquiries, you can, of course, get in touch with me. Okay. So I'm just going to have a second. I'm going to have a little drink. Um, And I'm going to have a little read through the chat. So I'm going to pop my mic off for a second uh, to give me a chance to read through the chat, answer any questions that are in there. If you've got any questions, please do pop them up. Uh, we've still got a little bit of time left. Okay, so the first question actually is about uh, gap years, <laughs> which I've just talked about. So if a student decides to gap year, do they have access to uh, track services, including support from the subject teachers and the UCAS coordinator? A little bit, but not as much, I think is the is the answer. You, if, you're, if you're taking a gap year and you leave, you can still request a reference from us, but you will not get the same level of support because you're not physically in school talking to us. So there will be, you, you, you can ask us for a reference. We will absolutely provide a reference for students, but what there won't be is the same level of support with sort of course choices and and things like that because, you're, because students aren't there for us to be able to offer that support to them. Uh, if students take a gap year before uni, what are the options to defer the start date? I think I've covered that one already. Uh, so you can defer it for the, for the year after. Um, if you accept the course, if you, you know, so say you apply now to start 2025 and you decide you want to defer, that is up to the uni as to whether they will allow you to defer or not. It's at their discretion. And that doesn't go through UCAS. You need to contact them directly to ask that question. Uh, do I have an information about Art Foundation? So I do, but the best uh, per people to speak to about Art Foundation are the art teachers. They are absolutely experts and they do a lot of guidance, guiding our students through, an art, through Art Foundation applications. So your child's art teacher should be the first port of call. I can give you some general information um, if you want to email me, but they can give you a lot more information. And you apply for Art Foundation, you don't apply through UCAS, you apply directly to the university or college for Art Foundation, but the deadlines are quite similar. So Art Foundation courses, the deadline is usually the beginning or middle of February. Again, you have to check each one individually to find out the, the deadline. Uh, any advice if child is not sure they want to go to university? Do we help with making and exploring alternatives? We do. Uh, we uh, do a lot of work around apprenticeships and around uh, sort of alternatives to university. Um, it is worth mentioning the vast majority of the SWAP students do go to university. Um, so uh, about 85% of our students apply, about 80% of our students go, which is a really, really high number. So there is a lot of focus on university, but we all have guidance and support for students who want to do other things. I do know they can feel a bit left out at this time of year, um, but we, we are trying to redress that a little bit and give a little bit more help. Um, I understand that a lot less people are applying for university for various reasons. Do you, have, do you advise an alternative? So same as we just said there, actually more people are applying for university than ever. It's actually the number of applications going through UCAS is increasing year on year. Um, 
so university courses are are becoming more competitive, not less. Um, but we do advise on yes on uh, on alternatives. Uh, we also have good links with people like Ask Apprenticeships, Camden Apprenticeships, and employers, as you've seen from Futures Day. Um, presentation, I will, uh, if you would like to email me, I will send you the slides over for the presentation, anyone who would like them. Uh, if my child doesn't feel like going to university after year 13, do they need to complete a UCAS form anyway? Um, if they think they might, they should because they don't pay for it until the end. So there's no, there's nothing lost except a bit of time. And writing a personal statement is really good practice for applying for jobs or applying for apprenticeships or anything like that. Um, so I would encourage every student to complete a UCAS form because if they then change their mind in say November, it's much easier for them to apply. And if they don't, it's been good practice and they've not really lost anything. But if they are absolutely certain they don't want to go, we won't force them. <laughs> Um, right. With a degree level apprenticeship, how do they fit in work or study? Or is it just work that gives them the degree level qualification? No, it's not. They also have to study. So uh, degree most degree level apprenticeships are full time work with them weeks off for study weeks. And during those weeks, they will go to university or go to college during those study weeks. Some do a four days on one day off uh, kind of uh, system, but most don't. They do full-time work and then two weeks off say uh, so they will be expected to study and complete work in their after work you know, after work as well so a degree apprenticeship is a demanding option for students it is challenging uh, what specific engineering fields do apprentices the apprenticeship program cover and how does the school help with placement of students in apprenticeship so there are lots and lots of different apprenticeship fields uh the engineering fields covered by apprenticeships again it depends on the job on the company itself and the job that's being offered uh but we've seen apprenticeship uh, there's lots of uh sort of digital and uh, sort of engineering apprenticeships we've seen civil engineering uh apprenticeships there are automotive engineering apprenticeships but again they are individual to the companies in terms of uh, how we help them, uh, we can provide one-to-one -one advice, we can provide guidance, we can pro provide support with applications. What we can't do is sort of guide, it, students have to find those opportunities themselves. We can signpost them towards where the opportunities are, but they have to find the ones they're interested in and, you know, let us know that they want to apply for them because applying for an apprenticeship, students have to be really sort of proactive in doing that. Uh, can you apply for UCAS and for an apprenticeship? Absolutely. Yes. And we would encourage students to do both if they want to. Uh, they can then during the year decide which one they want to go for and they can have UCAS offers and apprenticeship offers at the same time and make their decision later. Um, is it still worth applying now if the student is considering an extra year of further education? Um, it depends. I would say usually if they're thinking of doing an, something like an art foundation year, then it's better to apply during the art foundation year because they will need to add that qualification to their UCAS form. And it may be then it's usually that their tutor for that year will be better placed to give them a reference than we will. Uh, but if they're not sure, Again, they can apply for both at the same time. So you can put in a UCAS application and say an art foundation application and then decide which one you want to go for later in the year if you're not really sure. Uh, when will the application be, when will this be on YouTube? Uh, it, hopefully tomorrow when I've buffered it and got it uh, clipped and sorted. Uh, when do students find out their predicted grades? So. Teachers are uploading their predicted grades to UCAS now um, alongside their subject references. So students should have their predicted grades in September. Uh, how do we support students applying to schools overseas, for example, in the US? Good question. We actually had a visitor on Monday from Georgia State University uh, in, in the US talking about exactly that, doing a uh, 
a presentation on how to apply to uh, to American universities. Obviously, it's a completely different process that uses the Common App. Uh, it is quite it, it's not complicated. It's just different. Um, I would advise that if a student is interested in applying to overseas universities, they should let their form tutor know in the first instance. And it will probably be me that does the guidance on that because I've got a little bit more experience with it. Um, and I can also be that student's kind of sponsor uh, here. I, I won't write their reference if I don't know them very well, but I can deal with the common app for them. The main barrier for most students in terms of applying for a uh, university in the States is the cost. Uh, there is a uh, American university is extremely expensive. And uh, as an overseas student, you're not entitled to the same loans. Uh, you can't get a UK student loan to study in another country. Uh, so unless uh, un unless you have uh, sort of many, I mean, some, you, know, you may have many tens of thousands of pounds uh, that mean that you're able to pay for it. But if not, it can be quite challenging in terms of financing it. Uh, but that is something that I can advise on if a student wants to come to me directly. As I say, Rachel, also Rachel, who came in on Monday and did the talk, has given me her email address and is happy for students to contact her directly. And she's obviously got loads of experience. <laughs> Uh, can you get a predictor grade for EPQ when the assessment will not be made this year? So um, we, AQA, who is the exam board, is the AQ, is the EPQs we do, advise that we don't give predictor grades for EPQs because it's a holistic assessment that's made right at the end of year 13. Uh, but it depends when the EPQ teaching finishes. So, for example, at Ackland Burley, we finish our EPQs in December of year 13 so for some so usually we can give a predicted grade by that point because students have done most of their work by the time they they do their application but it does depend a little bit across all the swap schools as to when they finish their epq so the best thing in that case is to talk to their epq coordinator or supervisor directly uh, i suggested applying early when does the application process open it's open now uh, so UCAS is now open. You can all so you can uh, do your UCAS application. You can't submit it until September, uh, but you can do it now. Uh, when uh, will parents also be given uh, the mock grades and based based on September mock exams? So there aren't any any mock exams in September. I believe they're at the end. I believe they're in October. Year 13 uh, predicted grades. Uh, predicted grades will be given to students uh, and they will also be on the progress report that comes out after those exams in October. But I'm not actually sure when predicted grades are sent to parents. So I will check that for you uh, because I don't know. Cast grades. I'm not sure which uh, progress review cycle it comes out in. So let me uh, let me check. Uh, two seconds. Um, if a student is wanting to study a competitive course such as psychology, is psychology with foundation a good idea to go for? So I didn't mention degrees with integrated foundation years, but that is a really, really good comment. Um, an increasing number of universities now offer a degree with an integrated foundation year. So instead of it being a three year degree, it's a four year degree with a kind of year zero at the beginning. The year zero tends to be a more general year. So for something like psychology, it will be like a social sciences first year that covers methodologies and theories and things like that. And then you will spend specialize once you pass that foundation year. Um, foundation years are really good if students don't quite have the grades they want to go to the university they want to because they have considerably lower uh, entry requirements than the straight undergrad. Um, so I would recommend them if a student has uh, slightly lower grades. Um, I don't think if if it's just a matter of competitiveness, I would just recommend that they apply for the straight undergrad, because if you've got a student who's you know, predicted three A grades and they apply for psychology foundation, they're going to be really confused about why they're doing that. <laughs> and, they're pro and they might even change it. The university might just put them in for the straight uh, the straight psychology undergrad because their grades are, are too high. Um, so, no, I wouldn't recommend it in that case, but I would recommend it where their grades are a bit are a bit too low. Foundation years are also really good if you're 
BTEC or your A-levels aren't directly linked to what you want to do at uni. So if you've studied, uh, you know, say history, English and sociology, but you want to go and do uh, finance at university, uh, you might not be able to because you've not got a maths A-level, uh, but sometimes you can do a degree with a foundation year and it means that it doesn't have the same entry requirements. So if you've got a student who's changed their mind, that's a really good option. Um, what if HSE and predicted grades are lower than the final grades? Um, so in that case, if a student really pulls it out the bag at the last minute, does something really expected and gets like amazing grades uh, that are different, higher than their predicted grades, then they can use clearing to uh, change their course to find a different course. Clearing has courses of all grade ranges in it because it's just courses that aren't full. Uh, so other than Oxford, Cambridge and medicine and adjacent courses, pretty much everything else is in clearing or universities will have courses in clearing. Um, if they can't find anything they want in clearing or they don't they don't like what they want in clearing, they can always withdraw their application and put in another application next year with their final grades. Uh, do I know the current rate of interest on student loans? It's been capped. It's just been capped at Oh, I'm going to have to go and check. Um, it's about four, it's four point something percent at the minute. It has been capped. It wasn't capped. <laughs> and, the, and, and thankfully, the government did come in and, and, and sort that out quite quickly. Uh, hopefully, it will go down. Uh, I can't, I just, I, I don't have it off the top of my head. I will send it to you uh, if you, uh, when I, when I find it, it's actually in another presentation that I did quite recently. I just don't have it to hand. Uh, thinking about changing mind about university course, but demanding different A-levels. What are the options for doing a ne another next year or taking a gap year to do a different A-level? We don't offer that at the swap. We don't offer a year 14 to do an extra A-level uh, because we are a school, uh, because of the way that funding works for schools. Uh, we just can't offer that. Um, it, it, it's just not, it, it's not viable for us at all. Some FE colleges offer an A-level in a year. Uh, I know uh, West King do. I think Candy do. So they offer like an accelerated A-level that you can do in one year. But the best option is, so that is one option, or uh, looking at a degree with an integrated foundation year, which sometimes means that you uh, don't have to have the same entry requirements. Uh, just about Art Foundation, about paying. It's free if you're under 19 when you start. If you're 19 or over, you do have to pay for it. Uh, it's not as expensive as student loans, it's, but it is it is pricey. It's about five grand. Um, and you can get an advanced access loan to cover your fees for an Art Foundation, which it comes from the government. It's like a student loan. It's just slightly different. Uh, but you can't get a maintenance loan. So uh, you can only get a loan to cover the fees not to cover your living costs etc if you're under 19 when you start it you don't pay any fees it's free uh but again you can't get a maintenance loan to study your art foundation so that is that is actually a really good thing and worth keeping in mind uh i've just had a couple of questions about contextual offers that i'm going to try and like bring in together uh in a sec Uh, so just a bit more information about contextual offers. It, it's really hard to give information on contextual offers because some universities, lots of universities are really opaque about it and they don't tell you what the criteria are for making contextual offers. Some universities are really upfront and that's really helpful. The most common factors for making contextual offers are students studying at a state school, a student being from an area of with a high deprivation index, which, which is to do with both the postcode they live in and the postcode of the school. A school, a, a student living in or going to school in an area that has a low rate of participation to higher education. A student being in a, from a family that has no prior history of, uh, uh, of, higher, educa of higher education or a student being 
from a, a, a student having received bursary or free school meals. They are the they are the five kind of key factors, but universities weight those differently and they don't really tell us like what their formula is. Some universities really helpfully have a list on their website of uh, schools that they give contextual offers to. So Bristol have one, for example, all the swap schools are on there. I like these universities, they're very helpful, um, but often we don't really know. Um, Contextual offers usually bring the intro requirements down by one grade. So it will bring it down from AAB to ABB, for example. So if students are relying, they are great, but students shouldn't rely on them because it won't make an enormous amount of difference to the to the entry requirements for the course. Uh, it is usually only 